let's see how this goes. We're going to run through a couple more methods, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand out some scenarios, and I'm going to ask you guys to work on them, and I'm going to mix you guys up a little bit if you don't mind. So let's see how this goes here. So I do want to throw out, though, and a couple of people have mentioned this, that there are a couple of approaches that are a little bit more sophisticated, and the first that we're going to talk about has to do with the World Trade Center. Now, in the aftermath of the World Trade Center, in the cleanup, there was a huge amount of concern regarding the contaminants. There's a huge amount of public concern regarding what people might be exposed to. Um, partly, I think, just logical, rational, technical concerns. Everything that was in those buildings got all the chemicals and everything else. Um, and partly, I think, it was sort of to do with the trauma of the event. And the, Concern over the dust got sort of latched onto that too. So it was a very, very, very traumatic experience. And there was a great deal of effort done to um, come up with a systematic approach to evaluate potential hazards in the dust that was in the apartments or the buildings that surrounded the World Trade Center area. Is anybody here? I know a couple of people have some, have mentioned it, have some familiarity with this. Anybody here used World Trade Center values? Right? So they're out there. This is. Um, sort of explicitly designed to be a risk-based approach. So we'll throw that right out there, all right? We used the EPA RAGS document, Risk Assessment Guidance, right? Based on standard EPA risk assessment assumptions, ones that many of us are probably familiar with from site assessment work and cleanups and things like that. Now, understand who are, I who, are who, I who were the the target audience. What are we concerned about? What population? We're talking about industrial here, but for rags, it's the exactly. General That's exactly. This is a general public risk assessment. This is based on residential, right? Not occupational. This is a residential model, right? So understand that going in. This is a residential model. Um, pesticide model was used for settled dust. Two routes of exposure, ingestion, dermal contact. They did a very elaborate screening study to identify potential chemicals of concern. And then for the chemicals of concern, they established the um, uh, screening levels. But here's my point. I've been talking all afternoon about, boy, I wish we had risk-based levels. Boy, I wish we had risk-based levels. Boy, I wish we had risk-based levels, right? Well, here we go. And I can go through these different factors, if you like, right? But I've got all these factors for contamination and transfer and surface area and frequency and body weight and everything else. And every one of these factors has some element of uncertainty associated with it, correct? So what do we do when we daisy chain all that uncertainty? We multiply all those 10% or 20% times each other, right? All of a sudden, we've got a number that's, I don't even know if it's within a couple of orders of magnitude of some real number, right? So it is risk-based, but inevitably, to get these risk-based numbers, we end up with this huge amount of uncertainty. All right. So again, the technical part of me really dislikes that. I don't have any way around it, but the technical part of me really dislikes all that uncertainty. Right? We factor in exposure time. We make some conservative assumptions. Fraction transferred to the surface of the skin, contaminant surface load. We go through all of these different things to come up with this daily dose rate according to the formulas. Um, and while it does give us a number, and there's that, that's, that's, I don't want to um, underemphasize that. It does give us a number. But boy, there's just so much uncertainty with that. I really don't know what to make of that number. Is that number any better than sort of closing my eyes and you know, throwing the dart at the dartboard? Right? And again, you can tell I'm not a toxicologist, right? Because that's kind of what toxicologists do. I don't mean throw darts at a dartboard. I mean, <laughs> uh, I hope there's no toxicologist here. Um, so we get a number, right? But again, understand risk-based. So all those assumptions. And how good are those assumptions? And is that exposure assessment scenario valid for an occupational setting, right? I don't know, but at least it gives me a number. So I'm going to throw one more out at you there. There is one more approach that is sort of risk-based. And if I had to pick one 
that is most suitable, this would probably be where I would go. And this is based on SEMI. This is a semiconductor industry group, SEMI S12 standard. And they give us a guideline for health-based cleanup levels based on either or, or dermal exposures. Different ways of calculating. You choose the lowest and apply them. And the formula, while it is still based on several factors, each of which has a significant amount of uncertainty, um, um, I I at least it's a little bit shorter. All right? So I'm going to come back to this slide in a minute. And it's based on reference dose body weight, surface area of your, that should say, exposed hands. Right? Fraction by mouth, skin contact efficiency, all of these various factors. We have standard factors for all of those except for the reference dose. The only variable we need is the reference dose. I've got a handout I'll pass out to you guys that has this. And again, this is all available. I'm not sure if the S12 standard is available online. I think you have to buy that. But if you do a little clever searching, there's a couple of sort of bootleg PDFs out there that you can probably find and download. Don't ask me how I know that, OK? I'm just saying. So, um, whoops. So I said we would come back to the meth standard because we were talking about that at the beginning. And as we mentioned earlier, part of the standard, in, and this was very good, part of the standard that established that really low level also charged OEHA with developing a risk base level. And they used a model similar to the S12, probably more like the World Trade Center approach. And what they did is they came up with a new value. So now we're at 1.5 micrograms. And if you recall, before we were at 0 0.1. And the benefit of that is that has, that has huge practical significance. Because what that does, again, in my qualitative just observation, not scientific study, is that level of contamination is not likely to be caused by sort of random recreational use of methamphetamine. We're not likely to see that level of contamination unless there was something more serious going on. So I'm really not convinced that even at that level, if it's on the roof, for example, that I got to pull down the roof tiles. But at least I feel less likely that I'm demoing people's houses just because someone you know, smoked meth there. Not not supporting that as an activity, I understand. I'm just saying we want the consequences to be appropriate. And by raising the standard, by using a risk-based method, I think we get a little close there. And we see it very practically in that methamphetamine standard. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. So um, we're going to come back to this, I think. Here's what I'd like to do. I have two handouts. I'm going to start them on opposite sides. I've got, I think, 40 or 50 copies. I'm not sure how many people are here. But what I'd like you to do, here's my two handouts. One of them is just, I'm going to keep this one. One of them is just sort of a summary and some references. You don't really need this for anything. I just kind of compiled this and I pass it out. So if you guys, this is helpful to you, you're welcome to keep it. The second one that you have will be a scenario. All right? There's 10 different scenarios. I'm going to pass this around. Just take whichever one you get. I'm going to ask you guys to take about five minutes, maybe 10, to kind of think in your mind how you would answer the questions that are here. And then after you guys have had a chance, maybe discuss it with your neighbors who are going to have a different scenario. All right? Then what I'd like to ask you to do, we'll give you another five or 10 minutes, but I want you to go find everybody that's got the same scenario that you do. And then I want you to see if you came to the same conclusion. You guys think we can do that? All right? And then we'll just take a few minutes to go through them all. All right? So that's sort of my game plan for the next half hour, 45 minutes or so. OK? You guys with me? So two handouts are going to go around. I'm going to start the, just the, the table on this side. And I'm going to start the scenarios on this side. And we'll see what happens. And maybe while these are passing around, I'm going to go through my uh, hazardous waste approach. So remember earlier when we talked about hazardous waste issues 
and I said you can't get from here to there, you can't use wipe tests? Well, I think you all recognized, at least theoretically, if we're in the hazardous waste world, we can. All right, so let me walk you through my, my, my explanation here. Let's say, hypothetically, that I have some steel plate. See my picture of my steel plate there? And it is, whoops, it is 36 inches by 36 inches by one foot. In metric units, 36 inches is roughly equivalent to one meter, right? So 36 inches by 36 inches is basically one square meter, right? I promise you the math will be simple. Now, I won't make you guys look this up. Cadmium TTLC is 100 milligrams per kilogram, right? You guys with me? Notice I'm using TTLC so we don't have to worry about those pesky extractions or dilutions or anything like that. I do wipe tests on my steel and I have a wipe test value of 100 micrograms per 100 square centimeters. Is that hazardous waste? Let's say that this is waste in this case. I'm scrapping it. I'm not recycling it. Or maybe I want to know if I can recycle it. How's that? Is that hazardous waste? Probably not, but let's figure it out, shall we? Can we figure it out? Let's see what we can do. I just happen to know off the top of my head, because I know these things, that one inch steel plate weighs 196 kilograms per square meter. And coincidentally, we happen to have a one square meter piece. So it weighs 196 kilograms, right? Now, 100 milligrams per kilogram is essentially one part per 10,000, right? You guys can do the math. So if I take 196 kilogram divided by 10,000, I get 19.6 grams. That means if I have more than 19.6 grams out of 196 kilograms, I would exceed 100 milligrams per kilogram. Simple ratio. Does that make sense to everybody? So now my question becomes, I know I have 100 micrograms per 100 square centimeters, but if I wiped all of those 100 square centimeter surface, would they add up to more than 19.6? Right? You guys with me? Now I think we all could just kind of look at the numbers and see that we're not likely to, but let's go through it systematically. Um, there we go. So I happen to be one square centimeter, I'm sorry, one square meter, right? That's just the size of my workpiece. It's pretty, how, pretty uh, convenient how these units all worked out, right? And that happens to be 10,000 square centimeters, 100 times 100, yeah? So. Bear with me, this is the only part that's even a little bit tricky. I have 10,000 square centimeters divided by 100 square centimeters per wipe means it would take 100 wipes to wipe the whole surface in 100 centimeter squares. Does that make sense? So if I take the amount per wipe, 100 wipes times 100 micrograms per wipe is 10,000 micrograms is 0 0.1 grams. 0 0.1 is less than 19.6. Therefore, as it sits, that would not exceed the TTLC levels for cadmium. Make sense? So it is possible, and you can do that kind of arithmetical exercise if it's a hazardous waste determination. Right? But just like I said at the beginning, we're not really most of the time doing hazardous waste determinations, right? And then you could do the same thing if you wanted to do T-clip or things like that. And you can even do the same thing for your epoxy countertops, six kilograms per square foot for the one inch epoxy countertops. Again, I just know this kind of stuff just off the top of my head. So you can see that it is certainly possible to, to at least explore this hazardous waste issue, but you can also see it would take a lot, a lot of surface contamination to get up into hazardous waste territory, right? And I strongly suspect that we would, we would have to have visible layers in order to even approach these values. All right. Does everybody, does that make sense to everybody? Anybody have any questions, comments, concerns? Does everybody have the two handouts? Oh, they're working their way around. I got it. Everybody got a handout? Two handouts? So why don't you guys each take a couple of minutes. Feel free to share with your neighbors and colleagues. 
Take a look at your scenario. Think about which approach you think would be most suitable. You guys don't have to sit all the way in the back if you don't want to. This isn't like your final exam. You're more than welcome to cheat off your neighbor. I don't know if their answers are any better than yours, but. You guys want to take a couple more minutes? And then maybe we'll try and break up into groups. So I tell you what, why don't, we, why don't we all find each other and take a few minutes and discuss everybody that's got your same scenario. Can we do that? So why don't we start and just kind of do like group one, two, three, four. How many do we have? Scenario two. Ten? Five. Just kind of work yourselves around. So like five, six in the back, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's like an odd, yeah, you, boy, you got one, you're in the right spot.
This is your chance to make new friends. I guess two or three. There's only like 30. Logically, though, it should be like the higher numbers that should have the shorter. Fair enough. Fair enough. Eight. Nothing else will make everyone walk around a little bit. At least it makes it harder to fall asleep. What number did you get? No threes? Did you get the softball? That's boring. What, what one do you want? You can make it up. You can make, yeah, add to the, uh, you can change it if you want. Monomethyl oristat, so uh, a highly potent compound, to highly toxic. Did I not give you anything on there? You just have to know this kind of stuff. So just it's a it's a highly yeah yeah you're it's a highly toxic. Um, it's one of those ADC compounds. I'm just messing with you. So I don't know how we ended up with so many different numbers of different in different groups. Number eight. Sure. I didn't hear. But you know what? You're a nice guy. I'll agree. Well, the PHA would assume probably that they're using their hood to do the work that they're doing. So if they're cleaning the hood, they can't. Because it's not the point was that they've got safe handling and working safety and all the 
If you're working with potent compounds and you're, I mean, it's, it's really very similar to a emergency response where there will be a structured decon. If you're, if you're coming out of a, of a, a for, for that kind of a work environment, now I'm not saying there couldn't be, I'm not saying it's impossible for there to be a spread of contamination, but, but there, it'd be reasonable to assume that there would be a structured process to decon out. Well, it wouldn't be required. I mean, you certainly could. But PHA wouldn't apply to anything that's on the table here. I mean, you could follow the management of change and... That's a good question. I would suggest for the sake of our little tabletop exercise here that you're just magically impervious to everything. So don't worry so much about the mechanics of how you do it, just sort of the values that you'd apply and the, I mean, I'm not minimizing those, but I think that would just steer us the other way. Yes, ma'am. I missed in here the unit when I was taking notes while you were talking about Micrograms. Oh, okay, good. And I, and I thought that if I convert this in centimeters, uh -huh, I'm, uh -huh. but I don't know how to do that. Yeah, no, that's, um, <laughs> that's a nice technical approach. Let me, let me refresh my memory here. Um, all right, so the question is, we're looking at arsenic, and so you're going to... It's actually uh, what you said, it's uh, airborne. Right, but, uh, so you want to go with... Yeah, I mean, you can do that. You can assume that if, you, I mean, are you, so you want to use that, the, the convert the OELs, you want to take that approach if you want to do that. So you can take your 0 0.1 milligrams per cubic meter and assume that you breathe 20 cubic meters gives you 0 0.2 milligrams exactly, just like exactly. Because now you're in, you're in milligrams. And this would be milligrams still. You're, this, should, this is correct at milligrams. Milligrams. Yes. Because okay. it's 0 0.01 milligrams per cubic meter times 20 cubic meters. So this stays at milligrams. Uh -huh. And then you're exactly right. If you want to use that approach, okay. then you can go 0 0.2 milligrams per 100 uh -huh. square centimeters. But then I want to see, uh, does that make sense? Well, uh, this would... Not no, necessarily. Not ne it doesn't matter. Correct, because this is just for that, for okay. that 100 square centimeters, okay. is it 100 or not? And that is certainly a, a approach that is certainly in the semiconductor industry that, that people use. Okay, yeah, because you said it, otherwise uh -huh. I have no Uh-huh, that's right. I mean, you have a choice because there's comparative approaches, but yeah, you'll find in that industry, that's really where this was... Yeah, yeah, and there's a couple of industry publications, a couple of guys that um, wrote books a couple of years ago, and they've just kind of been internalized, and then that's the way they approach it. Do you have, where are you from? Oh, okay. You never know what you're going to find, huh? Okay. Uh-huh, that's right. And um, I don't know, are there a lot of semiconductor, that kind of thing? I, I did, it doesn't seem like it to me. No, so I, I guess the city, um, uh, and they tend to cluster. I mean, we used to have a lot more in San Diego. We don't have so many anymore. Um, they have a lot in Portland now. A lot in Portland for some reason. Silicon Valley still has a lot. Um, they don't have the big manufacturing ones like they used to. But there are a lot of small and medium-sized facilities. And then, like I said, a lot of the like all the solar plants, they were using sort of similar types of technologies. So they're taking that same technology and, and using it as they tried to figure out how to make the solar cells. Now, are these like industry 
That would be an approach. The TLV is universal. So the, the TLVs are like the PELs. You know, OSHA has the PELs. NIOSH has the RELs. ACGIH has the TLVs. And Fed OSHA never updates the PELs. Cal OSHA does. And so the Cal OSHA PELs pretty much track the ACGIH TLVs. Mostly what I do is I look to see which is lower. I look at the Cal OSHA PELs and I look at the ACGH TLVs and I'll just pick the lower of the two. Nine times out of ten it's going to be the TLV, but there's a couple of places like hexavalent chromium where the PEL is lower than the TLV, but not many, just a couple. But the TLVs are from the ACGIH. Um, you can now, they made an agreement with OSHA and OSHA technical documents now reference TLV values where they where they have where they where they exist. So that's kind of nice. Otherwise you have to buy the TLV book. And it's stupid. It's a little paperback book and it costs like forty or fifty dollars for this little paperback book. But that's what you have to get. But that's a good one for um, good hazard assessment. No, I I don't think I ever seen this before. I just made that. I just All put that right. together. It's just a yeah. summary of the different things that we're talking about today. No, because OSHA doesn't have, well, the only values OSHA has is that as free as practicable. That's it. There are no numerical All values. Right. So this right. just has I'm the World Trade Center. Where have I been because I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, this is just mine. I just, I just put it together for my own use. Okay. I thought maybe other people would like to uh, like to see it. How are you guys doing? A couple more minutes? I see furrowed brows, heavy concentration. We're just planning dinner for later. That's. Chemically, I mean, I don't know that we need to get into the weeds on it, but chemically it goes from hexavalent naturally to trivalent. So it will degrade from hexavalent to trivalent. It's going to stay at tri. Or it's old, or I, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's just the chemical ratio. That's just the way it would be chemically speaking. So would the sulfate be uh, Oh, probably not. Probably not anything you'd have to worry about. But it's not really what we're worried about from a wipe test. Like I said, I've certainly had where I've had to do wipe test for methylene chloride. And every time it's like, but sometimes it's just a matter of um, picking your battles, you know, if it's couple of wipe tests to make somebody happy, we'll, we'll do the wipe test. For me, the whole indoor air thing, I think I regulate But what does that even mean? But clean compared to what? I mean, are you talking vapor intrusion, like soil vapor intrusion? So we have approaches for soil vapor. That's a different deal. But it's just like, the term air quality, that's another one of those ones that makes my skin crawl a little bit because it doesn't really have a meaning. It doesn't have, you know, there's no such thing. Like, compared to what? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That's interesting. I, I, don't, I, I don't pretend to know all of it, but I will tell you that ambient mold in the environment does weird things. Now, I've certainly never heard anything about TCE, but maybe you've come, have you ever come across our dirty sock syndrome?
right. And, and all sorts of stuff. I mean, if you do, if you do like a, a whole air sample summa canisters, the levels of detection are so low that you see like the ethoxylated alcohols from the uh, from the uh, alcohol hand wipes. You see everything because it's just floating there. Now it's in PPB levels. So now you're stuck with what do I do with this list of 150 different chemicals at PPB? You know. If you got specific chemicals of concern, but if it's um, non-occupational, is it really appropriate to evaluate it to the exposure limit? Because mostly office people, partly it might be a matter of defining our terms. When I hear the term indoor air quality, that to me is more in an office, non-manufacturing. If it's manufacturing, it's are they above or below the TLV, right? But if it's an office area, I expect, if I'm an office worker, I expect the exposures to be Lower, like dust. Anyway, that's a different topic. Right, and if you've got soil vapor, that's, that's a whole separate issue. There's protocols. Why don't we take another couple of minutes, and then maybe we'll go through. OK, it's got to figure it out. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Yeah, it's there. I put it up there last night. I'm sorry. Yep, I hear you. And in my mind, I would love that there be some sort of consistent approach across the state. I don't know. That would be fantastic. I don't know, because there's never been sufficient interest in, in the rulemaking process. It takes enough concerned people to, to move it forward. Um, but it would be good, because frankly, even if it's every one of these approaches has strengths and weaknesses, but at least if we knew, it would be consistent and clear cut across the board. Exactly right. That's right. I got chisels, I got whatever. I, you know, to be honest, I've never actually done that kind of comparison. That's interesting to me. Are they consistent? Really? Interesting. Well, and I think that that's probably what it is. If you kind of went through the different factors that were plugged in there, uh, that's very interesting. I've never done that before, but I like it. I like it. If I have the choice in the matter, I like using the semi-standard values, but not many people have heard of them. More people have heard of BNL and WTC, so I tend to do more closures on WTC values. So if they say, I, mean, I guess it depends on the conversation. But for the most part, that's probably what I use more often than not is the WTC values. I absolutely. But to me, it would be even better. I mean, at least if we're not going to be consistent across all the Koopas, if you work within your Koopa and say, what are we as a Koopa going to do? This is how we're going to do it. That's a little, that's a little building block, right? And then the neighboring Koopa, you know what I mean? And maybe we go that way. I don't know. Exactly. You know, step by step to where we have a, a, a standardized approach, you know? Because like I said, as I do work all over, everybody's a little different. I never quite know what I'm going to get into. And some of them are like, I don't care. Do whatever you want. And other ones are like, no, we want it to be just like this. And I want wipe test for all these VOCs. <laughs> all right, why don't, we, um, why don't we take a few minutes? Here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to take a few minutes and go through these scenarios. And I'd like you guys to kind of tell us what your scenario is. 
and then walk us through the question. But here's the thing. We've got sort of a big room. So when you guys do it, we're all going to need to be quiet so we can hear. And then we'll take a few minutes and discuss. Does that work for everybody? Can we do that? All right. So like I said, the only thing is we've got a big room, and we're all kind of um, a lot of background conversation. I want to make sure that, that as the groups go through, we just make sure that we're quiet enough so we can hear uh, all of the insightful thought and comment and deliberation that went into these. So can we just do them in numerical? Does that work? You guys want to go? One large lab suite with small ante rooms on perimeter, intensive use of solvents and various organic compounds and hoods, general use of organic compounds, acids, buffers on lab benches, no metals, no potent compounds, no hazardous powders. The company is relocating and needs to return the facility in a quote unquote safe condition and to address landlord concerns. So, chemicals of concern. Um, we didn't have any specific chemicals of concern that we identified. Um, uh, who's likely to be affected? Most likely the future building occupants. However, the uh, building could be configured to use. Um, what action, if any, needs to be taken to characterize the contamination? Our thought was primarily a visual examination with uh, uh, the possibility of doing some qualitative pH test strip uh, sampling within the interior of the fume hood evaluate that condition. Um, what actions, if any, should be taken to remove contamination? Um, our thought was that uh, it should just be subject to general cleaning, not necessarily decontamination unless the, the results of the visual inspection or the pH verification indicated that there was something that was uh, out of line. Um, uh, other decon, if, if indicated, uh, would be performed. Uh, what actions taken to evaluate decontamination effectiveness. Again, as you're meeting the quantitative criteria here that we're looking at, we didn't have uh, uh, effectiveness criteria. Uh, regulations uh, and, uh, that would apply the uh, uh, potentially fire code uh, requirements or hazardous materials business plan if they stored or handled quantities in excess of thresholds uh, or possibly local uh, municipal codes or ordinances And how clean is clean? Is <coughs> if it looks clean, it probably is clean. Um, potential receptors, basically, it could have been anybody. Industrial, uh, we don't have any idea what the potential future use of the property is. So it could be anything from unrestricted to uh, industrial scale. Um, health effects uh, of the listed here. None of them really apply. They'd probably be more like a, a acute uh, reversible effect, um, potential burn toxics, et cetera. But again, um, not something that uh, would, would likely to be uh, present post uh, uh, thorough cleaning. Um, and that's about it. Anything to add? Any thinking things like that? Knocked it out of the park. So. So, so this is one where, um, is it appropriate to say, look, we're just going to make it physically clean? What do you guys think? Do you have any thoughts on the subject? Anybody disagree? i got to admit, in a circumstance like this, this would be what I would typically do. You'd make it so it looks clean. If it doesn't look clean, if there's stains, discolorations, something like that, I don't know, maybe we'll lift up some floor tile or something. But mainly, it's really that focus on physical. Anybody here think in a circumstance like this that they think it would be prudent to do more than just sort of the qualitative uh, pH paper testing? What would you do for your floor drains? I, I say I don't know. I mean, most labs don't just because they get value engineered out. I wish they had more floor drains personally. I'm less worried about environmental contamination. I would much rather have a place for the emergency uh, eye wash dow shower water to go, rather than from the second floor to the first floor. Um, 
but let's say we did, what would we do? There's a p-trap, so we could at least evaluate the p-trap. I see in, in olden days we would be worried about mercury accumulating there. We see so little mercury in labs these days. I mean, I'm not saying we don't necessarily want to check, but I'm not as concerned. Um, the one other thing Todd mentioned earlier, whenever you got fume hoods, you might want to check your fume hoods for perchlorates. That's a simple qualitative test. But by and large, I think I would agree. This is a fairly straightforward physical cleanup. Yes? All right. Thank you, group number one. Uh, group number two. Group number two. Are you going to prove that? That's it. Put her on the spot. Uh huh. Breaks into labs? Is that what you said? So let me back up a little bit and just introduce oh, it to the group. And I, so they did, it, it's just a really toxic, highly toxic compound. That's it. Something so, really bad. Okay. So use of the highly potent compound in D and ethyl solutions is in the biology suite, and the company is relocating and needs to return the facility in a safe condition and address landlord concerns. So just real quick, this is similar to the first one except that we've got the introduction of this potent compound, this highly acutely toxic compound, both in powder form in one area and also used in solution in a second area. All right, so where did you guys go with this? Those kids that are going to come into the nursery school, they're going to they're going to put there. So what could be taken to be, uh, to be used for cleanup? You could use pretty much any kind of a, a cleanup agent and absorbent towels to 
try to do a wipe for this stuff. Uh, my thought was if they put in a solution with DMSO, it sounds like that's a solvent. Um, not the best thing to be inhaling without a respirator, but you can certainly use it on wipes and use your cleanup with that in that chemistry suit. Um, afterwards, to evaluate what kind of cleanup. Can I, let me, can I throw one other thing in there? Okay. Just to refine that. How many, is anybody here familiar with DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide? Oh yeah, it used to be that uh, rubbing agent. And, and, and what happened? And that uh, gal went to, was it uh, Riverside or whatever? No, 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 no. What, what does DMSO do to you? What happens when you? Toxicity or something? It crystallizes your blood. It, it's not so much toxicity, but when you put it on your skin, you instantly taste it. And DMSO has this unique property that it's very good at carrying substances across your skin. So they're using it for lab purposes, nothing to do with that. But I just felt I would interject that if this were not just a tabletop scenario, that would probably not be our solvent of choice. It would be like you know, putting extra bullets in the gun when you're playing Russian roulette. But I, I understand. I'm just I'm being a little facetious. I I understand. So what action should be taken? Maybe evaluate it. Um, sounds like it was powder. You could do an air sample, perhaps, to see if there's anything residual. Hopefully, if you wiped everything down, there won't be much residual air. Do wipe samples. Uh, what regulations would apply, uh, apply? Well, they've got their scoop business plan, so whatever that local agency disclosure requirements are. But if this is such a nasty compound. That's a really good point. I've never looked at that. Would it? Does it have to be in the CalArt program? That's what I'm thinking. It's not going to be on the list. And I don't think there's just a blanket LD50 criteria. Yeah, I mean, unless you had, like you said, unless you had 10,000 pounds of it. Correct. Correct. You're right. You're right. You're right. Um, See, see, to me, this one, the wipe test, let me ask you guys, what kind of wipe test values would you think would be appropriate for this highly toxic compound? Highly, like the most highly toxic thing that we've got on our table here. Is there a known chemical deactivant? I think caustic breaks it down. I think like sodium hydroxide will, will break it down, but it's relatively stable. But let's say there is. Then soak the crap out. But tell me what you guys said again. How much would you like? Of all the things, this might be one of the areas where I'm going to go, remember we talked about the methamphetamine example and they sort of set it at limited detection? I kind of feel like this one, I don't really necessarily feel I need to screw around too much with exposure assessment assumptions. With this one, I'm kind of comfortable saying, you know what, if I can detect it above the limited detection, that's kind of too much. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about sampling strategy and where are we sample and how much. I, that's just going to be whatever the analytical is. There happens to be an analytical method. If it's a milligram or Correct. Or whatever, you're not going good to point. But, but I mean, you wouldn't know this, but I, there is a, a, a good sensitive analytical method. So it exists um, not for MMAF, but for MMAE. So luckily enough, you're in good shape. Um, so in this case, but where I'm going, in terms of the question of the day, right, how clean is clean? We learned like a dozen different approaches that are used to establish clearance levels. Of all the ones on the table, the comparative and all that, I'm kind of thinking for this one personally, I'm kind of with you guys. It's just so nasty, right? It's right up there with, I mean, it's not quite botulinum territory, but it's pretty square, scary nasty. So to me, I'm not worried about the whole body weight, surface transfer, all the, I'm saying the heck with it. If I can measure it, assuming I've got a good analytical method, that's probably too much. And then the next question, which we haven't talked about and it's more than we want to get into right now, is okay, where do we measure, how many samples, all that kind of stuff. That's a whole different, different question. What do you guys think about that? Would you guys agree? I feel like we got people in the front and people way in the back. Couldn't you get farther away? 
There you go. All right, number three. So let me, let me jump in real quick. You guys understand it's a little bit of a strange scenario. Do you remember when this happened, Todd? So what they're, they're using an old-fashioned kind of a vacuum pump. And this vacuum pump uses hot mercury in essentially a glass vessel. And it's used to create a very low vacuum or high vacuum, however you want to phrase it. It's heated mercury inside a sealed container, but of course if that glass breaks, then all that mercury vapor can escape, which is what happened in this scenario. That mercury vapor then settled out across this manufacturing area. So that's your scenario, settled mercury. You guys have to consider um, how you'd evaluate or, 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 or how clean is clean. So where, where did you guys go with that? Okay, just plug that in there, just made that one up. I don't see it in there. Okay, so that's your number. Okay, awesome. Yes. Uh huh. So you did the 20, you did the, the exposure assessment assumption of, of 20 times based on 20 cubic meters uh, per, per air per day. Okay. Awesome. So the question I have for the group is they chose the Sort of the industrial, are you, are you guys industrial hygienists? Uh, that's right. I play one on TV. Um, the, uh, they chose sort of what I call the IH approach then, where you take the allowable inhalation exposure, multiply it by a daily breathing amount to come up with the dose, put that into 100 square centimeters. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Anybody think another?
satisfied with when that tool was fully working. That's interesting. That's it. I mean, the Lumex is super sophisticated. Yeah, and he's done cleanup where the one example was, yeah, the kids got it from uh, their dad had it for stuff, but he was gold mining. So he was separating the gold that way from the ore. And they thought it was so much fun, they put it in, in uh, water balloons and drove around the street throwing it at each other. Nice, <laughs> nice. So they took a whole housing track and covered it with sulfur. That's cool. So let's say, leaving aside the sort of the, the pesky real world details here, um, let's just talk about exposure limits, clearance levels. So you guys chose the IH value versus maybe the WTC or one of the other. How come? I'm curious. What was your? Just because of the accuracy of like your mesh and being able to get that into the value. OK. So as long as you were getting your airborne number down, makes sense. Makes sense. I appreciate that. All right, anybody have any thoughts, comments? Okay. So, it worked. Yeah. And it was easier to get there. Yeah. All right. So, four? You just iconoclasts here. Yeah. All by yourself, David? No. Oh, okay. That's it. I'm an IH. I'm going to sample my way out of this problem. I'm going to jump in just because I didn't realize the time, and I've been having so much fun. But I want to go through a few things, and I really don't want to be here more than we are supposed to be here. I'm sure you guys feel the same. So I want to, I want to just, we're going to just focus real quick on the clearance standard. So your guys' clearance standard, what, did you, what do you think would be the appropriate clearance standard for your scenario? Well, OSHA has standards for But for the surface. OSHA has a standard for that. It says as free as practicable. Correct. So would you say as free as practicable is workable, or do you think you need a numerical standard? We'll put you on the spot. I'm with you on this one. What do you guys think? I think as free as practicable is reasonable, because this is using 
This is the scenario that the standard was written for, right? Ongoing work, ongoing cleanup, keep the clean areas clean. We know the dirty areas are going to get dirty. Just don't let the contamination spread, assuming that the other safety measures are in place. Now, the other one, you guys, I'm sorry, were four? Yes. Number five, who's my number? So you guys had the same scenario, but instead of ongoing work, they were selling. So what did you guys do? Just give me the clearance standard. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. I like it. Yep. I tell you, sometimes it gets surprisingly difficult to do the encapsulation approaches. It seems like it's just going to be awesome, but it doesn't always work as well. But in your, I just, I'm, in my mind, I'm contrasting the two. For, for the ongoing workplace scenario, sort of the comparative approach seems fine. But I think for, I'm agreeing with you, for, for this one where we have a property changing hands, if it were my project, my scenario, I would be picking a number. I would be going with probably the World Trade Center number because it tends to be more conservative just so I had some sort of independent third party justification. So it's lead, so we could do that. That's explicitly residential and it's really low. If you can, if you can get there, I mean, yeah, that's awesome. If you can get there, if you can get to a residential standard, then you know you're very defensible. All right, that was six? That was, you guys, are, you're five? Who has number six? Numbers all by yourself? <laughs> so ion implanters um, where we're relocating a tool that is potentially contaminated with arsenic, correct? So what just what was the clearance standard you guys chose? So the same industrial hygiene approach, essentially taking the exposure limit, all right? And why this one? And do, I'm sorry, somebody else had number six too? Oh, oh. And what did you guys feel? Uh huh. Right. And this is one where we just kind of need to get it clean enough not to live with it for a, for, for a working career. It needs to be safe enough to transport. Right? So it's a little bit different scenario. We're not talking about an exposure assessment assumption that extends over 40 years. We're talking about safe to handle for a short period of time. So this to me seems, seems fine. Okay, so that was six, seven. What's the issue with seven? Seven. Okay. Right. You know what I would think about that? All I'm thinking about that is it has waste or not. As long as it's not has waste, I mean, I, I'm being a little facetious. Whatever workers are handling it certainly need to be aware of the hazards and handle it safely. But, but in our scenario, this scenario said these ovens were going out as scrap. So as long as it's not so contaminated, we went through that little exercise such that it arose above regulated hazardous waste levels. I don't care. I mean, again, assuming the workers are protecting themselves and that kind of thing, right? So in that case, uh, it would be appropriate in my mind to do that kind of exercise and determine that you'd have to have like some huge, crazy high number of surface contamination such that you could probably shake the... That's right. That's right. Just kind of wipe it clean and call it good. Exactly. 
All right, so that was, you guys were seven. Number eight, do we have any number eights? No number eights? They left. <laughs> Going once. Number nine. Who's got number nine? All right. So I'm thinking of the house separate from the garage, because I think all of us are thinking that concrete's coming out of the garage. So what's your chemical concern? We have two on the table. Which ones are you more worried about? That's kind of where I was going. The VOCs, I'm not so worried about. The chromium, I'm going to do a risk-based number. What do you think? I would think the World Trade Center values would be very appropriate because they are explicitly residentially based. So that to me would be a very appropriate number to apply. Um, all right, number 10. I'm assuming it's you guys because we've gone all around the room. Oh, uh, yes. This is a little bit of a trick scenario. I will tell you that in high, I mean, you guys, I'm sure, probably already understand this. In sort of high sensitivity populations like this, I don't care what your number is. It's never going to, I mean, unless it's zero. So I mean, this is another one where we could argue all day long about risk assessment assumptions and exposure modeling and all of that. But in a medical setting, kind of like a school, if there's anything sort of above the limit of detection, you're going to be really on the defensive to have to justify why that's adequate. I'm not saying there is a risk. I'm just saying you have to understand how are you going to say in that medical setting or that school or whatever. So that's one where we're essentially going to have to go with whatever the limit of detection is, even though the logical part of our brains may be saying different things. So I have taken up concrete in medical offices for broken manometers before, just because you're, just, you're not going to get the mercury out of the concrete. You guys have any questions about this? I get a couple more slides. Sir. In reality, I would do air samples. In reality, I would do air samples. In your scenario, probably need to reword it. It's real tough to do a wipe sample on a concrete floor. It's just not smooth. You know what I mean? It's, it's too porous. So. Yeah, mer I mean, we could, I could tell you stories about mercury. We just don't have time. I did. I used to work for a large school district. Well, you've done a lot of school. They ripped up a gym like an old from pre-World War II gym that had this parquet floor. And after it had been a gym, it had been used for a science lab for about 50 years, <laughs> right? Back in the days when mercury was just awesome and cool to play with and coat pennies and all that kind of good stuff. So you know how much mercury went through that floor over the years? And I was there because they were super concerned about creosote or something crazy like that. One. <laughs> they lifted up that floor and it was shiny. That was in a high school, at an old urban school district. It wasn't used as a lab anymore. It was mostly used as a storage room, and they wanted to repurpose it. All right, I, I only have a few minutes, so I'm going to move quickly. Sampling strategy. We're just not going to have enough time to talk about this, but here's what I want to throw out there. We've talked about the results before we've talked about how we're going to get our samples, right? Now here's the thing I just want to put in your minds. When we do sampling, we usually have this idea that we are collecting a representative sample, correct? However, is there any reason to think that surface contamination is going to be distributed in any sort of a uniform fashion? It's going to be based on the nature of the work activities. So sampling strategy and all the kind of strategy stuff we do doesn't really apply. There's no such thing as an average. 
is where I'm going with this, right? So the whole mentality of sampling strategy, you have to think carefully whether it applies. If it were contamination based on work activities, the location of machines, I don't need to do some sort of overall area sampling. If it were contamination that may be resulting from some sort of airborne process, where it may be deposited out over a larger area, it may be that one of the statistical sampling uh, strategies that we're familiar with might apply. But we need to consider that. It's not automatically applicable. All right? So that's one thing. We have guidance in, e in, in our uh, 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 EPA guidance, but we need to think about whether that applies to our circumstances. And we do have a different sort of guidance from the industrial hygiene world, where it gives us a sort of a strategy to identify how many samples to collect to tell us if, uh, to give us a certain amount of confidence that we have a, a sample collection in the highest certain percentage. However, again, that requires some underlying assumptions about how the contaminant is distributed. And I'm not 100% sure that they apply in all cases. So we need to think about that aspect of it. All right? So do we have a, a population, right? Whoops. And then. Or is it better to just rely on professional judgment? I targeted worst case. If I'm going to collect clearance samples, I'm going to be looking for what are the worst case areas, because I'm really trying to identify presence or absence. I'm not trying to characterize a group mean, right? That makes sense? A 95th percentile value or something like that. All right. And. Let's not talk about the wipe sampling variability. I asked you earlier, not how many people, again, how many people have done wipe tests? If we each wipe tested the same area, do you think we'd get the same results? No. no. It's shocking. Because um, I've done it, not in a controlled, but I just know that I've wipe sampled an area and my technician has wipe sampled an area. And you wouldn't even believe they were in the same building, right? All over the place. There's a lot of variability in wipe sampling. There are some standardized methods. But even with those standardized methods, there's a lot of variability. Short answer, wipe sampling kind of sucks. It's just not a good sampling method, right? I know there's microvac methods. There's a bunch of other things for particulate. None of them are super well validated. So um, you know, kind of take that in there. So wrapping up, general summary here. Um, mostly my message to you is not we're not leaving here with an answer like, boom, here's the solid way to do it. I just want to give you some points to consider. All right? Oops. I'm trying to find my laser pointer. Identify, think the process through like we've been talking about today. Where are we at? What are our standards? And then a plan. And then document everything. I'm a big on documentation. I'd like to see a nice closure report. Right? We don't always see that. Sometimes these activities get done. Everybody rides off into the sunset. But there's no record keeping. There's no documentation for future users. Um, the report, or I'm sorry, this presentation is online so you guys can get it. It's got links to these various things that we've referenced today. And if anyone has a question, um, I'm happy to hang out a little bit, but I don't want to keep you guys 430 right on time. All right, anybody have any questions? All right, thank you guys. I appreciate it.